I thought that uh, in order to talk about where we're going in the future, I'd start with just a little bit about what we just experienced with the legislature. Because as you know, back in 2020, um, there were a lot of new Republicans that were elected and they were very extreme. And so uh, we got a, a, a lot of the sort of more moderate people or people that you could maybe work with every once in a while, right? Like Thorpe and Jay Lawrence, those people are not there anymore. Or Campbell or Steve Pierce, those guys were all not terrible, right? <laughs> and those people are not there anymore. So the Republicans that came in were very, very extreme. So it's much, way more libertarian to the extreme. So that's how we got the, uh, the critical race theory, the anti-mass, the anti-vaccine, you know, all this really horrible stuff. And so, this was actually one of the longest sessions uh, in recent history. And I think the only one that was even close, I, I think it stopped in like maybe mid-June. And that was lo so long ago, Phil Lopes was in there, right? So that was like in the aughts or something. And so it didn't end until June 30th. And if it had gone one more day, the state workers wouldn't have gotten paid. And so the goal for the session is always 100 days. And 100 days is around mid-April. And we were pretty much done at 100 days. But what took so long was that they had these incredibly extreme ideas like the flat tax, uh, you know, Mesnard's alternative tax, which was the attack on, uh, you know, Prop 208 to take down Invest in Ed. We had the, um, the anti-teacher uh, uh, free speech bill, you know, that you, like, it, which was alluded to earlier, that you can't, you know, you talk, it's hard to talk about the Holocaust or slavery or any of these issues because you have to say both sides now, like, Maybe the slaves were pretty happy, you know? I mean, I don't know exactly what they want you to teach on that. So they had these really extreme bills and some of them actually died and others weren't moving because they knew it was just gonna be such a fight, not only with the Democrats, but with some of their members. And so what they ended up doing, which you know became then part of the lawsuits later, was they ended up stuffing all these bills into the budget and then of course forcing their 31 members to vote for it. And so, that's how you got some of the court cases, you know, and the Democrats and even some of the, the nonpartisan legislative lawyers said, don't do this, you're going to get sued. Well, they just do it anyway because they like to get sued, right? And so um, the, we had a lot of those really extreme bills that were stuffed in the budget. So it was like ESA expansion, um, STO expansion, the anti-mass stuff, some really extreme voter suppression stuff the um, reducing the duties of the Secretary of State as long as she's a Democrat, you know, things like that. There's a list of like maybe 45 items that got stuffed in the budget. So after the session was done, you know, they, um, they got sued uh, in multiple ways. They got sued for the single subject, which was the, all that stuff stuffed into the budget. And they actually lost on that one, so that was good, you know. We, we didn't win everything in the courts and the petition drives, but we didn't lose everything either. So uh, that we, they stopped that single subject. Of course, Bronovich and Ducey are repealing, you know, because they want voter suppression. They want to uh, target teachers, you know. They want to, um, you know, ban critical race theory. They want that stuff in there, you know. So that was kind of a setback for them. Uh, but what did happen, there were actually a lot of other bills that we were trying to stop with those, the referenda. Remember, there was the petition drives in, in August and September. I'm sure many of you participated in those. And so there were six referenda. Three of them were trying to protect the education fund, right? And so the Invest in Arizona ones, uh, for a little tiny refresher for you guys, was the one was against the flat tax. One was collecting signatures against Mesnard's alternative tax, which was the takedown of 208. And the other one was the tax cap. So of those, the only one that got enough signatures to get on the ballot to stop the bill was the flat tax. And that was the worst one of the bunch. So I'm glad that the flat tax, if it you know um, survives all of the challenges, because there will be court challenges, that one should be in, so that, that flat tax has not gone into effect. So the others, the alternative tax, um, that got more than the minimum of signatures, but probably enough, not enough to, um, to do a challenge. And then um, 
the tax cap didn't make it. The three that were against the voter suppression, those also didn't get enough signatures. But one of those bills was, you know, protecting the duties of the Secretary of State. So Arizona Deserves Butter actually got one of the things they wanted, even though they didn't get enough signatures. So the, all of the voter suppression bills pretty much went into law at the end of September. And so this, I know you guys already have Kirsten Cinema on your brains, but this is one of the reasons we have to take down that freaking filibuster because we need to protect uh, our voting rights in this country. You know, they all of their stuff uh, went into um, law, except for maybe some of the extreme ones that were stuck into the budget. But there's going to be more of this. There's going to be more anti-education bills in the future. There's going to be more voter suppression. There's going to be more anti-abortion because they, we had a lot of bipartisan votes in 2021 because they needed the Democrats on some of the, you know, more common sense things like, you know, taking federal money for child care subsidies for the poor. So, you know, it, we voted with the corporate Republicans and on that, but on the really bad stuff, they are solid. Voter suppression, anti-abortion, anti-public health, uh, you know, anti-public education. They totally want to take down public education. You could see that in those debates that we had. I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, it, it's, it gets to the point where it's so absurd, you know. I, I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall, right? <laughs> and so, um, so uh, the other thing that the courts uh, stopped, which was good, was the anti-abortion law. And so Texas got a lot of, of, you know, play on how bad their abortion law was. But uh, a Representative Athena Solomon and Diane Post say that the Arizona one was even worse. And so that also has been at least temporarily delayed in the courts. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of problem and opportunity. That's what we used to say in, in, uh, in public relations, right? You don't have a problem, you have a challenge. So we have a lot of challenges coming up uh, because these people will be back in 2022, or at least um, some of them anyway. Um, but there are going to be so many open seats, you know. We've heard uh, across the country about, you know, people quitting their jobs. Well, lots of people aren't coming back to the legislature or if they decide to go on to another, um, another um, position. You know, for example, we, you know, Kirsten Engel, her, she resigned to run for Congress. Stephanie Saul Hamilton was just appointed. So that means there's going to be an a, a, a appointment in LD10 for her house. Representative Fries is stepping down and not going to come back to the legislature in 2022. So there's going to be an appointment in LD9. Um, in um, LD11, you know, the Oral Valley, Fincham's uh, district, Brett Roberts said, I'm leaving Arizona. So he's gone. Pratt died. Uh, Lieberman stepped down. I mean, there are lots of people who are leaving the legislature. Some are leaving before the next session, and many are running for higher office, which means they're not running for a re-election. And so you're going to have a lot of LDs that are going to have two open seats. And so that might make you nervous at 2 o'clock in the morning, or it might make you think, hey, we got opportunities too. And so I figured out that... Um, LD 9, 10, and 11 will have an appointee and an open seat in 2022. Uh, 2, 27, 29 will have two open seats in the House. Uh, there are also GOP districts like that, you know, where you have open seats for GOP people because, it, you know, again, just to refresh your memory, we have Diego Rodriguez running for AG. We have uh, Martin Quesada, Quesada running for Treasurer, Bolding running for Secretary of State, Fincham running for Secretary of State, Bullock running for Secretary of State. None of these people are running for re-election in the legislature, right, is my point. Weninger running for Treasurer, Daniel Hernandez for CD2, Andrea D'Alessandro running against Rosanna Gobbledone for LD2, Chavez, Cesar Chavez running against Richard Andrade for LD, um, I think, 27. Uh, so... I bring this up because when you want, when you talk about what do you want to do for the future, we have a lot of risk and a lot of opportunity in the future, and we we have to look at these seats. Right in in 2016, there were a lot of people who ran for office that were not supposed to win, but they still won. And the De House Democrats had one of the biggest freshman classes in a really long time in 2016. That's when I got elected. That's when Kirsten Engel got elected. That's when 
the feisty freshmen got elected. All these women got elected in 2016, and we shook it up. And so what I am asking the universe for is that we get another freshman class in there that is going to shake it up in 2023 when they take office because we're going to need some strong people running for office. And so this is your task. If you know anybody who is smart and can ask questions and think on their feet and fight for what's right, they need to run for office in the coming year. We have a lot of nutty people running for office. We need some good people. And so that's all I have to say. And... Uh, Thanks for the time.